we're going to bring you a brief revision recap summary of some of the common nerve injuries of the upper limb. And this is part one of three similar sessions. So what we aim to do is break it down into individual nerves of the upper limb and we'll talk a little bit about some of the common mechanisms of injury. We'll relate that very briefly to some of the relevant anatomy and then we'll talk about injury or deformity as a result. It's very important to remember that the anatomy we touch on here is simplified and it's quite a basic so it's important that you continue to read around and use all the rest of the material that you get from your anatomy sessions. Uh, this is very much a revision um, a little bite-sized recap of some of the things that you might need to know for your exams. So in this first session we'll talk about the radial nerve and the auxiliary nerve. So to start with the radial nerve um, and there's a few quite quirky ways in which you can damage your radial nerve and one of them results from for example falling asleep with your arm over the chair and this is sometimes called Saturday night palsy. Imagine a drunk man who's come home and fallen asleep like that. Um, similarly, if someone was to sleep on your arm for a long period of time, then you can the pressure can result in damage to the radial nerve. Um, very occasionally, having an instrument under your arm like a crutch for a long period of time can also damage the radial nerve, and that's sometimes called crutch palsy. In trauma, you can have um, fractures of the mid shaft of the humerus, uh, such as that one pictured here, or sometimes proximal humerus fractures. Can damage the radial nerve in the axilla, but the midsoft humerus fracture is the classic one. So let's quickly recap the anatomy of the radial nerve, which is a continuation of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Um, originates in the axilla and travels between and innervates the two heads of triceps. Um, and then, what's most important here um, is that it descends down the arm in a shallow depression within the surface of the humerus known as the radial groove. And on the video here, you can see outlined in blue, the radial groove. So it runs very close to the bone um, in a groove within the bone, and that's where it's susceptible, susceptible to injury, such as with a fracture. You can imagine it being transected or compressed. And because the radial nerve innervates the extensors of the forearm, um, uh, wrist and hand primarily, the common presentation of an injury here is with a wrist drop, and that's unopposed flexion of the wrist and hand, as you can see in the picture. The sensory disturbance is to the dorsal aspect of the hand, um, as outlined in the picture here. So let's move on to the axillary nerve, um, which can be damaged in a number of ways as well. But most commonly, it's damaged by direct trauma to the shoulder or the proximal humerus. And common mechanisms of injury include fracture of the humeral surgical neck, um, shoulder dislocation, or perhaps iatrogenic injury during shoulder surgery. Also, as with the radial nerve, um, compression from walking with crutches for a long period of time, and sometimes even misplaced injections from the deltoid. Um, here you can see a proximal humeral fracture on x-ray, which we'll try and relate to the anatomy now. So when we remember the anatomy of the axillary nerve, um, it's also a continuation of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. So it's formed in the axilla. It exits the axilla um, at the inferior border of subscapularis by the quadrangular space. And it's often accompanied by the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the vein. What's most important to remember here is that the axillary nerve then passes medially to the surgical neck, as you can see here, um, before giving off its terminal branches. So one of these branches, um, the posterior terminal branch, is shown here in the video um, as it continues as the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of, nerve of the arm. And this is um, supplying sensory innovation to the inferior portion of the deltoid, which is known as the regimental badge area, as we'll see in a second. The auxiliary, art, um, the auxiliary nerve innervates the deltoid and teres minor muscles, and so these will be affected 
um, by an injury to the axillary nerve, um, rendering the patient unable to abduct the affected limb. Sensory loss, as described, is the inferior portion of the deltoid muscle, which is termed the regimental badge area, because that's where uh, military personnel might have a, a badge displaying their regimental badge. The axillary nerve is also um, injured as part of what's termed an herbs palsy of the brachial plexus, but we'll come on to talk about that in another session. So that's a very, very brief and simplistic recap of some of the common injuries to the radial and axillary nerves. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Please do supplement this with reading around the subject and going back through all your anatomy material. And um, we'll see you again for um, another two sessions about upper limb nerve injuries. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. It's Tony and Satya, and we are bringing you a revision recap of some of the common nerve injuries of the upper limb. So this is part two. We've already talked about the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about the ulnar nerve and the median nerve, two important peripheral nerves of the upper limb. Uh, as in last time, we're going to start with uh, talking about some of the common mechanisms of injury, and then we'll relate it to the relevant anatomy at a very basic level. And then we'll talk about the deformities and injuries that result. So let's start with the ulnar nerve and we can talk briefly about some of the mechanisms by which it can be injured or damaged. Now, most of you at some stage would have hit your funny bone. Now, that's not an actual bone, but in fact, the reference to the medial epicondyle in the elbow. And at this point, the ulnar nerve runs very closely by and is often sort of twinned or damaged temporarily when you hit it. The ulnar nerve at several points in its course through the upper limb travels through very tight spaces and at these points you can have entrapment or compression. Uh, for example, at the elbow, it travels through the cubital tunnel and at the wrist through Guillon's canal, which are both um, common areas of entrapment of the ulnar nerve. Um, you can have traumatic or penetrating injuries at the wrist that directly injure the ulnar nerve because unlike the median nerve, it travels above the retinaculum. It's actually more vulnerable to injuries like this. Uh, as we've said, the medial epicondyle is an important relation of the ulnar nerve and fractures here or dislocations at the elbow, as shown in the x-rays here, can result in damage. So the ulnar nerve that leaves the brachial plexus um, travels down the medial side of the upper arm and at the elbow it passes posterior to the medial epicondyle, as you can see here in the diagram. You can actually palpate that on yourself um, and hopefully appreciate that that's a point of particular vulnerability to injury. Um, the ulnar nerve innervates most of the intrinsic muscles of the hand um, and perhaps most importantly clinically it innervates the third and fourth so that's the medial two lumbricals which act to flex the MCP joint and also to extend the interphalangeal joint. If you do have injury, you have an ex unopposed extension of the MCP joints and you have weakened extension or flexion of the IPJs, which results in this claw hand type deformity. Sensory innovation is to the medial one and a half fingers. And this area is typically where you get um, pain and tingling or sensory loss as a result of ulnar nerve injury. So let's move on to the median nerve, which can be damaged in several different ways. Most commonly, however, it's the result of a carpal tunnel syndrome, which is entrapment of the nerve at the wrist. Arthritis, pregnancy, diabetes, and acromegaly are all well-known risk factors for that. You can also get penetrating wounds, which can damage the nerve directly at the wrist. Or more proximal lesions can result from supracondylar humeral fractures, particularly common in children, as shown in this x-ray here. So the median nerve actually begins laterally and midway down the arm crosses the brachial artery to become medial. It enters the anterior compartment by the cubital fossa. But most importantly, as shown in this video, it enters the hand beneath the flexor retinaculum through what's called the carpal tunnel. 
and that's the main site of injury by compression. So carpal tunnel syndrome presents usually as a result of the sensory disturbance and that's pain and tingling in the lateral three and a half fingers. The symptoms are often worse throughout the night um, and in the morning. Interestingly, the palm is sometimes spared because the uh, palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve is given off before it enters the carpal tunnel. The median nerve also innervates the muscles of the thena eminence, and those include the ones that flex and oppose the thumb. So if you have an injury, you can have wasting of the thena eminence and lose the ability to flex and oppose the thumb. And that's the main difference between humans and apes in the hand. So it's often termed ape's hand when you have this deformity. Otherwise, the median nerve innervates the pronators and also the flexors of the hand and wrist. So if you were to try and make a full fist, only the little and ring finger could flex completely and you're left with what's called the hand of benediction, which is something you might want to look up. So that's a very quick recap of uh, nerve injuries to the ulnar and medial nerves in the upper limb. Um, obviously, there's a lot more complexity and detail could be discussed. So um, we recommend you do some more reading around the subject and look back over your um, primary teaching on the upper limb and nerve injuries. But thanks very much and we'll see you next time.